So it is February, which is the start of audition season for all of you high school students and college students looking to change so as we get ready, as I continue my long spiel about college advice and scholarships, how to get the most out of what is out there, I wanted to bring in one of my buddies who I went to college with, um, and I'll let him introduce himself, but he has much more experience in the realm of auditions, uh, certainly a lot more than I do. So I want to bring in my buddy, Bobby. And Bobby, if you can kind of introduce yourself, talk about what you do in your background, and then we'll just jump right into it. Hello, everybody. So my name is Bobby Barron. I am... Currently in the United States Navy Band, I met college. I met Caleb back in college at North Texas when we were working on trying to figure out what we were going to do with ourselves. So I've known Caleb for a little while. So currently I'm in the Navy Band. I've taken plenty of auditions. I teach privately, so I teach little students kick button take names as well. And then I went through the same programs as everybody else. Started in elementary school, fifth grade, playing the horn, did district band, state band, everything everybody else is doing. I'm no different or any more special. So I've been through the I've been through the ringer, done plenty of auditions, everything from middle school district band auditions all the way through professional level. So we'll see what you guys got for questions. And for those of you who are my students uh, who might not be aware, Bobby does have a an Instagram page. Where he regularly posts uh, content. Um, it's mostly low brass related as he's a Unionium player, but there is just general music stuff and brass knowledge. So if you are interested uh, in that, check out his Instagram page and you can see it's high impact low brass, which is his name on the uh, live stream also. And he's also got some other materials that are on his Instagram page to uh, a warm up book and a link to his YouTube channel. And his YouTube channel is uh, a ton of just videos and music that you can listen to, especially for you low brass players who don't necessarily get a lot of low brass love. So um, all of that is good content. And then he regularly puts out uh, videos and challenges and uh, works with students. And so he's really good about all that. I know that most of these people here actually are low brass people. So there's a whole like tuba conglomerate that watches all my stuff religiously. So first step, just quit now. Yeah, and just now quit. Let's get started. That's the best audition advice you can have quit. Yeah, no, but really, um, I remember my band directors told me they're like, "Oh, you want to be a band director? Yeah, you don't. You maybe just find something else to do." And I was like, "No, nah, I know what I want." And here I am. Here I am. Okay, so as we talk about auditions, you have a lot of audition experience. So, what are some of the big tips before I kind of prompt you? What are some of the big tips that you tell your students or people who are, are talking to you on your channel about auditions and getting ready for auditions? So. For most auditions, especially in like the high school, middle school, like the younger kid age, you're going to have scales. So you want to win an audition, learn your scales. If you don't have that done, I don't care how you play anything else. For those auditions that are based around etudes and things like that, you need to be able to play great music. Not all the notes, not all the tempos. Like all, What is important is that you sound different and better. It matters how you sound. So learn your scales. If you have those on your audition, learn your etudes. That's great. But make good music and sound better because at the end of the day, that's going to be what separates it out. Because from a judge's standpoint, if you're going to hear 100 tapes or if you're going to hear 60 kids over the next six hours of your day, you're it's going to start to blend together. So you need to hear somebody that sounds different, that sounds clearly at a different level. Even if there's some mistakes, those will be more easily forgiven. So First off is just basically sound good and everything else is bonus points. If you do that, you're, you're going to be set up because not one time as a judge turned to their co-judge and said, wow, that kid sounds terrible. We should let them win this audition. So sound good. All right. So are there any things right off the bat that irk you that they should avoid at all costs when they, when they audition, whether it's the way, the way they play or the tempo that they choose or just things that immediately turn you off or that, you know, turn other people off. I would say don't go too fast. It's I would say as a judge, I don't get turned off. It's not going to bother me if you're having trouble. Like I'm I'm there for you, not the other way around. But as far as little ticks and things you can fix very quickly, number one, don't go too fast. I would rather you do something slowly and well than rush at 10 clicks because you heard your buddy trying in the warm-up room and then crash and burn. Second thing is don't stop and go back. You make a mistake, just eat it and keep moving. That's a that's the quickest way to hear who are the more immature players and who aren't. Just do not stop and go back. And then I would say probably like the third thing you can do is making sure that you don't have a lot of space in between um, sections. So like if you're if it's a like there's five or six steps in the audition, don't pause for 20 minutes in between each of them. Don't do too much of a warm up at the beginning. Like basically 
your time is yours as the person auditioning. But remember that the judges are trying to shove a lot of people through the system quickly. So if you're in, if you're causing that to be kind of messed up at all, it will leave a very sour taste in the mouth of a number of different judges. So just watch your timing and your pacing for an audition. And I would say those are the three things. So don't stop no matter what happens. Keep your pacing smooth. And then also just make sure you keep your tempos where you can play them well, not where you thought they should go. One of the things that my students ask me a lot, specifically when they're getting ready to audition for universities, they'll, you know, they'll audition for two or three universities. Do you think it matters in the cycle of like uh, the spring semester when they audition early, late? Does it, does it matter if they're good? Is this, a, is this a, an element that, or like a, what's the, a variable that we're just overanalyzing? Take the first if audition spot or the last? I would say if you were a top three in the country player, it doesn't matter when you audition. But if you're on the fence, if you're hoping to get into the school or whatever, I would say you need to be aiming for like the middle or middle end. The kid, And that goes, and also like if you're taking an audition, let's quickly talk a little strategy. It's not that you can't win as the person that plays first in an audition. For instance, like when I took my Navy Band audition, one round I was the first player of the day, I was number one. And the next round I was the last player of the day. So it works either way if you're playing well. But I think if you have a choice, you always want to be in the middle of the pack. In the beginning of an audition process, the, the judges have to get to know each other if there's more than one. From a score standpoint, they've got to keep the numbers sort of balanced so they can't start too high or too low. And if anything, they'll always start too low, not too high. So if you have a choice, always audition in the middle of the pack, whether it be number 17 out of 30 or whether it be you audition the third month out of five that you're allowed to, I'd always shoot for the middle because that's also where the judges are starting to fatigue. They're waiting for someone to go and do something well for the first time. It's going to be a chance to really kind of capitalize the most. I don't think it actually matters that much. And frankly, if you're the best in the room, it doesn't matter when you go. But for those of you that are spending more time playing games than actually practicing, aim for the middle. <laughs> Along with those other like games that don't really matter, but they do, that can help them hurt you. Right now, a big question that I'm being asked is if a student should audition in person or virtually or if it matters. Some of the universities are hosting in-person and, and virtual auditions. Now, I've been telling them you should go in person as often as you can, especially if the weather is not terrible. Have you had any of these issues and what do you prefer and what do you tell your students? If you're auditioning, if you have the option, first of all, you take care of yourself and your family first. Because frankly, like your stupid college audition does not matter one bit in the grand scheme of the world around you. So first of all, stay safe. Like if you're worried about COVID or whatever else, like stay home, no one's going to die. At the same time, though, I think that if you have the option to get in front of an audition panel, they're just genuinely going to be more happy about it. Especially at this point, we've all been shut down for so long. It's nice to at least be sitting in front of something that's living and breathing other than yourself. So I think that would help. I don't think it's going to help you get in or not get in, but it also will give you advantage. However, I think if you're on the fence, if there's three of you that are tied for the spot and they don't know who to give it to, if you're the one that actually literally had a warm conversation with the with the professor, whoever it is, I think that, again, is a little advantage. But I would say, again, that's pretty low on the list and not something I would be freaking out about if you just simply do not have the means to audition face to face. It's not going to matter. Another thing that doesn't matter, but does matter in, in, in that it's unrelated is how to dress. I, I remember working in the College of Music auditions at UNT and just being shocked at what people would wear to their auditions. <laughs> Can you just talk about what they should wear and what they shouldn't wear and why that matters from a professional's perspective? Yeah. So if you walk into a room, all right, so let's be clear. Most of the people you're going to be studying with are like 65 year old white men. Like, so it, it is what it is. But at the same time, you need to remember that there's a certain expectation of just college professors in general. They're usually going to be a very, they're very like, they've been in their own little bubble of, of academia for a while. They're going to be focused very much on like the prim and proper and the, the etiquette of the scenario. So like at North Texas, Dr. Bowman was there. Okay, Dr. Bowman's not a young guy. He's been around like he expects a certain amount of respect, as he should, as any professor should. And so if you just come in looking like you rolled off the street, you're already at a disadvantage. Like you're going to have to play exponentially better to overcome that initial reaction versus just wearing a, a nice like button up shirt. I would say if you're going to be even if you here's the other I would say this is a fun little sneaky question. I don't care if the audition is technically blind. At some point, if you win an audition, you come out from behind the screen and do an interview or you get congratulated or there will be a picture. 
So if you've got on, like just because a professional organization, a college audition, whatever is blind, you need to be dressed well. Now, I also personally recommend you come in later. So like for me, for us as guys, Caleb, we would wear like a button up shirt, but I wouldn't put on the tie during the, the blind audition portion because I want to be comfortable. I'd have my top button on button. I'd still look well dressed, but I wouldn't be completely ready to go. But in my case, I would be carrying a tie, a coat, so that if the interview process came through and I played well enough, I put the tie on, put the coat on. It looks like I've been a killer all day long when, in fact, it's just part of what I'm carrying. So like and then on the opposite side, if you're someone who's really comfortable in a dress, know what you're going to want to wear. If you want to wear pants versus something else, you need to know what you're doing. And frankly, that needs to be part of your preparation. You should be practicing before a recital or an audition in the in the outfit you will be wearing. If you're going to wear a tux, you better be practicing with that with the bow tie on. If you're going to have you know, a lot of flowiness in a gown or something that you're wearing for a performance, you and you play an instrument that that might become an issue, you need to rehearse with that because that will matter at some point for most people. It's silly, it seems quick, but it, it'll take you two days of work and make a huge difference in the way you show up. So now that we're talking about the audition itself, we've gotten into the audition room, you'll have um, potentially a selection of atubes that you can choose from or excerpts that you can choose from or a a list of solos. I know that at UNT, they gave us a long list, but some universities aren't like that. They give you a specific list. Mm -hmm. For the places where you do get some choice in the matter, what might be some logic about how to go about building that audition list for yourself? First thing you always want to do is just fast and slow. So if you have, for a lot of college auditions, it's just prepare something that shows off your skill as a musician, and it can be out of any of these 25 books. So the first thing is play something slow and pretty, and then bring something technical. That's the most basic audition. It shows your balance as a player. It lets you show off a bunch of everything. So if you have a choice, choose something that has a little fast and a little slow. Next thing to choose is, again, similar to like we talked about earlier, picking tempos you can perform at. Pick something you can play better than everybody else, not something you can sort of get through. What a lot of people don't understand is the, the, the people that are judging an audition don't want you to play poorly. They're hoping they can hire you. They're hoping they can bring you into the band. They hope that they can have you join that university. And it's basically on you to screw that up. They're already rooting for you. Inherent. It's literally their business to keep you involved. So picking balanced music, stuff you can actually get through and play. If you're an undergrad, if you're 18 years old as an undergrad and coming into college, do not try to play some 27-year-old DMA recital level piece of repertoire that you simply cannot do anything other than look bad doing. And then again, like we talked about earlier as well, sound good. It matters that you sound good, show off what you can do, and also show your potential as a musician. So things like cadenzas, phrasing, things like this are going to be important to allow you to have a little bit of balance in your audition so that the professor, the the whoever it's going to be can hear not only how you can play right now, but what they think they can turn you into in a year, in four years, in 10 years, whatever it may be. In the audition itself, you know, sometimes the audition block is only 10 minutes or 15 minutes, but you've prepared way more than that. And I remember uh, a couple of weeks ago, one of my students was talking about how in their audition, they didn't get all the way through the solo. The professor actually stopped them. This isn't necessarily a bad thing. And from your perspective, can you talk about why that might be and why they would cut you off in the middle if it's not going terribly? So first off, misconception to be cleared out right now. If you get cut off in the middle of an audition, it is almost always because you're playing better, not because you're playing worse than everybody else. If I know that you're the top three player, I frankly have heard enough three bars. I don't care anymore. And if I got to eat up time and make up that direction on the judges, like the logistics side, I'm going to do it with my strong players, not my weak ones. So if you don't get to play all your music, that's normal. And if anything, I would almost view that as more flattering than something you should be terrified about. And then also, if you're, if you know, it's always going to be a little weird doing the first audition that you have with that organization or that school or whatever. But over time, you're going to start to notice that clearly if it's a full page etude that magically no one's ever going to play the full page. And then you can start to be strategic about where you think the best snippet of four lines would be. And you can actually, in essence, not only prepare the full page, but also prepare those specific spots you think might be where you go. And then that's going to be the where it, that's where it ends up. So like for me at the professional level, yes, I know an entire piece of music, but then I know where the excerpts are. And then even more tight than that, I know within each excerpt where the 
two bars that if they're going to ask for something sneaky, those would be the two. So you can get really niche with your with your preparation on that. That's somewhat of a bunny hole, I, a rabbit hole rather. I would say mostly just focus on not worrying if you don't play at all. It's almost never going to happen that way anyway. Uh, and then the last thing that I've got on my on my list is a lot of times when you go into a college audition, uh, professors will view that as almost a mini lesson. And one of my uh, one of my you know DMA teachers in undergrad talked about how if you're going to go to audition, maybe there is a little thing that you can kind of purposefully uh, put in there that they could fix. It's a gamble, uh, but they might turn it into a lesson. That audition might become an, a lesson experience, specifically for like university auditions. Uh, have you experienced any of that or do you have any thoughts about be, being teachable in that moment that 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 audition turns into like a mini lesson because they're the professors also kind of auditioning you to see how good of a student you're going to be too don't ever fake an injury y'all are wounded enough as it is you don't need to add anything anything fancy with that said though two things first of all your goal is to go into an audition play as well as you can but then any decent professor should have some feedback they should try to have you fix something now there's usually a difference between like a school of music audition versus a private studio lesson, especially at the college level. The school of music, they're going to churn you in and out. It's not personal. They're not teaching you. They're just hearing you play, sticking you in band and move on. But for a private studio and actually being accepted as like for you, Caleb, like a horn player in the school of music or for me, a euphonium player, we're going to basically have what is usually like a 30 to 60 minute lesson audition, whatever you want to call it with a professor. So bringing your best material and then knowing that you're going to be asked to do things and then just doing your best for it. You don't need to set the world on fire. It's not like there's not going to be any magic bullet. It's more having thoughts on what you believe in and what you think about. So if they ask you, hey, Caleb, why did you play that phrase this way? You actually have an answer. And then just recognizing that they'll inevitably pick on a couple of things and, and work on it. You do your best. Hopefully it improves. And the other thing I would say is this. The lesson or audition, whatever you want to call it, especially at the college level, you're auditioning the teacher, not the other way around. Because in no uncertain terms, for any of you that are doing music, this is your profession. If your teacher is not going to get you where you want to go, you don't belong with that teacher. So I also think that a lot of people, like when they say, oh, I'm super nervous about this, a best way to think about it as, as getting over the nerves is you should be you should be preparing the teacher to audition for you. And if you think of it like that, you're very much not going to be as nervous anymore because it's on them to prove why you should study with them as much as it is for you to prove why you can be a great student for them at the same time. Now, either you're really good at reading and talking at the same time or you just coincidentally stumbled upon this first question. Um, Elijah's um, actually watching with their class. That's actually super cool. One of the students wants to know, is it normal to be nervous during and before an audition? And I'm going to say uh, I get nervous after the audition because there's nothing I can do. So I actually get nervous after <laughs> after I played. So I, I think nervousness is going to primarily be tied to your uh, preparation. If you're well prepared, you're everyone's going to be nervous. OK, like my left leg shook like I was outside in the in the snow where you are right now, Caleb, like shook the last round of my pro audition. And I had no nerves at all. So at some level, some, some subconscious, I was literally shaking from the nerves and the excitement. But I think a couple of things are going to help. The more you audition, the better it's going to be for you. So any mock auditions, any opportunities you have, take it, and it's going to get easier. The second thing is, is mindset. So thinking about, like, I'm here to audition this professor, not they're auditioning me. And then being self-aware. Admit to yourself, like, I've worked really hard. Here are my expectations. So if you are going into as a college freshman audition, you're not expected to play like you're a 30 year old professional. You're expected to play your absolute best, do what you can, and then get into the studio. That's the whole point. And then also recognize, are you well prepared or you're not? Did you practice the way you should have? And then if you're honest with those, there should basically be no jitters anymore. And if anything, it should come across more of as like excitement, not, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, what what's going to happen? Um, okay. Okay. Any recommendations for choir auditions? I myself am not a vocalist. Uh, I'm trying to think. One of my good buddies is a is a opera singer vocalist. I don't know if there's anything specific uh, that I would say to a vocalist. As far as like what to pick or how to prepare. Yes? Question mark. <laughs> Elijah, you can be more specific in the chat. I would say for vocalist, I would want the same thing is is making sure that you are picking something that you can do well rather than. Uh, something that you think is flashy or showy 
And then the, the other thing for a vocalist, I feel like you could also do specifically for a lot of colleges and or like professional organizations is picking some material that has balance, like being able to do an opera chart, being able to do a jazz lick, being able to run over and do some kind of like pop songs, because it, like, let's say you're joining like a military ensemble. That's your job. You're going to go from singing a sea shanty on TikTok to singing a, an aria in the middle of a band concert to singing a barbershop quartet at, in the evening recital. So showing a little bit of your skill on the on the well-rounded options of repertoire, I think would be really important for a vocalist. So uh, Sean is one of my former students and he um, is actually studying music and he's gonna, he wants to be a uh, composer. He's really into Baroque music. So he's about 300 years late, but he <laughs> is, uh, he's, he's been asking me a lot about practice techniques and practice tips. And um, I can think of no better person to talk about practice strategies than the person who practiced for, you know, 45 hours a day. Uh, when he was undergrad. So can you just talk about, uh, Bobby, a little bit of your practice strategy in preparing for the audition itself? Um, maybe how you paced yourself or how you paced your practice sessions? Just a, a brief, I know that we could do literally an entire hour on practicing alone, but just some of the ways that you framed your practice around the audition. So around the audition, so at a high school level, you should be preparing basically only your audition material. you simply do not have enough time to prep anything else. So I do want you to still do your warm up, maybe a little bit of A2 work, obviously you're in band class, but otherwise the one or two hours, hopefully that you have, you can dedicate a day in, in, in leading up to an audition needs to be specifically dedicated to your audition material. You have to capitalize on that time. That's rule number one. If you are preparing above that for pro level or whatever auditions, you're, you are expected to not only be able to do the excerpt work or whatever it may be, you're expected to be a phenomenal, well-balanced player, period. So there's two very different worlds to be included. But I would say, first of all, make sure that you are focusing on the audition itself, but also maintaining balance of being able to sight read, being able to you know, learn how to phrase, how you're working on different techniques so that it, it, it's setting you up to be successful long term, not just only for this next audition. And then I would say I am I am the worst example to try to follow as far as practice. Yeah, like I practiced eight hours a day. I slept for four. That's not human. That's not normal. So while I would say that if you're the person that wants to try to beat someone like me, you need to make sure you're ready to do it and dedicated toward that cause. But at the same time, knowing your own limits. I would never practice more than one hour straight because you mentally you, you mentally cannot do it. I don't care how smart or how high level you are. You will not make it past an hour productively. Second thing I'd say is make sure you're focusing heavily on your warm up. It's going to be where you make or break your playing. It doesn't like if you can't play a long tone, you're never going to have to worry about getting to an aria. And then also I would say really focus on staying balanced with your time and also looking ahead. So if you know you got an audition six months out, until the last month, you should be playing nothing full tempo, nor all the way through. You should be only playing pieces broken down slow. If you're going to play a solo, you should never play more than two lines of it until maybe a few weeks before the actual recital. Now I feel like I need to bring you back for just a lecture on practice. Anytime. Um, okay, let's do one or two more questions. Um, this one's interesting. Should you be prepared to sight read in an audition? At a pro level, yes. It is automatically going to happen. Like it's, it's guaranteed at a college level. It depends. Most of the time there will not be sight reading, but it occasionally can happen. So I would say you need to work on that skill in general, but pro level. Yes. College most likely not, but still be prepared. And then for some States for an all state or an all district band, there will be sight reading and you need to absolutely be prepared. So make sure you can count, watch your rhythms, but it'll depend on the audition and you should know ahead of time. It's usually posted like there will be sight reading or there won't be. And your band director or your friends or somebody will be able to answer that usually for you in advance. Last question that we'll do, unless any others pop up, um, would, would uh, uh, improv be an important skill when it comes to audition? I would say in the classical world, I don't really see improv being a, a, an issue. I don't know about the military band if they like make all the trumpets double in, a, in some sort of jazz band What's your experience with yeah, that? Yeah, no, you're never going to need, if you're going to do improv, they're going to tell you it's part of the audition. Specifically, basically, unless you're a jazz player, you're never going to do improv in an audition. And more specifically, that while the material may be a surprise, for instance, like a sight reading, that may, you're not going to know what that is ahead of time. You will know that there will be sight reading. So if in doubt, the biggest thing is if you have questions right here, I would say this is perhaps one of the most important things we can talk about in an audition. 
if you don't know an answer to a question, send an email to the audition panel and say, I was wondering if you could help me with this piece of information. I am wondering if I have to improv. And they're going to be like, thanks for sending your email in, Susie. No, you don't have to improv, but we will sight read and then you move forward. It takes you 30 seconds. I know it's initially going to feel terrifying to send that email, but frankly, there are literally people being paid to do that job to respond back to you. And it's going to be so much better for you to know that answer for both you and the judges so that it goes again well for you because they want you to do well versus you holding a question in and then screwing something up that they assume you already knew. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts, any final words of wisdom about the approach to the audition, the the thought process, the preparation, the execution, anything that you didn't, didn't cover already? I would say if you truly hate it, it needs to be your canary in a coal mine. You either need to adjust the way you're playing and thinking about it, or you need to find something else to do with your life. It doesn't make Me you a bad person. Meaning it's that if just, you hate the audition prep, like you you hate the audition prep process, finding it, looking for material, if that yep. gives you dread, that's that's the signal. Exactly right. If you are sick to your stomach every day, you have to wake up in the morning and do and practice and get ready for your college audition. You shouldn't be going to college for music. That doesn't mean it doesn't mean you couldn't change that trajectory. It doesn't mean you couldn't adjust that. But if you truly hate this, number one, it's not like you shouldn't live life like that. You should be having a good time. It should be something you love doing and enjoy. And also in no uncertain terms from a strictly business side of things, you're never going to beat someone like me who wants to like, who thoroughly enjoys going to a practice room to prepare to beat you at an audition. So it's, it's twofold. So I think you definitely got to enjoy the process. The next thing is I think the biggest thing that everyone worries about is just nerves. Everyone has the nervousness, the excitement, the anxiety, whatever. If you can't handle that again, that's something you need to work on. And it should be something that, quickly once you reach a certain level i would say if you're like a, a junior senior in high school and anything older than that if you still get nervous for an audition that's another another kind of obvious sign that you need to either change your stuff you need to change what you're doing or get out because it shouldn't again kind of similar to you shouldn't be dreading it you shouldn't be so nervous or uptight that it's giving you panic attacks or either you're just simply not prepared or you just can't handle the 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 that pressure and it's not going to go well. You can't, no one's going to win an audition feeling like that. It only makes it worse. And then I would say I'd end it with just play, like do your best. Your job as an auditionee at any level is to walk in the room, play the best you ever had on a few things, do things that you never imagined you'd be able to do, recognize what you goofed up that you'd like to fix for next time, do everything you could, leave, leave nothing to chance, put every card, you know, put all your money on the table and go all in and then walk out and be done. It will be what it is. You will sit where you sit. You will place where you place and you'll, you'll be ready for the next audition. If you do that and you kind of set that as your expectation, your goal, it becomes very simple, very easy. It's more fun. Bobby, thank you for your opinions and your hot takes and your expertise, more importantly, on auditioning. Um, if you are um, a regular follower of the channel, you probably are already aware that on Sunday, I'm doing a conversation with a college band director about how to find a full ride in the music world because there are still full rides available and I wish I would have known that when I was a kid. Um, if you're on the Instagram and maybe you're not familiar with my channel, uh, Future Millionaire Band Director is the name of the channel and I put out a whole bunch of content. Um, really one of my passions is making sure that if you're going to study music, you're prepared to study music successfully and you don't make the same mistakes I did, which was getting into $75,000 of student loan debt because I thought that I needed to take out loans and go to fancy universities. So th that starts, of course, with finding music scholarships, which exist. You can go study music at a quality university for free and set yourself up for success. So that will be on Sunday. All that information is on the channel. Um, thank you guys for your comments. Thank you for watching all the way through, you dedicated few nerds, and we will catch you later.